Hi class, this is Dr. Darty. I am um, going to be covering the, the introduction to diagnostic imaging lecture. Um, I, uh, this is a pretty long lecture. There's 40 slides on it currently, so uh, feel free to take a break and pause this recording at any time. Um, it'll probably take multiple views and listens uh, before you feel like you can grasp the material better. Also, just as a reminder, a lot of this information is elaborated on in a very easy to read format in a textbook, which is in the library. Uh, it's by Carol McInnes, and it's called Fundamentals of Musculoskeletal Imaging. And again, there is a reserved copy in the library. Uh, if you want any more detail on this information, um, it'll, it'll do a good job of backing it up. Um, also, your uh, Goodwin uh, textbook, excuse me, Goodman textbook on um, pathology uh, for physical therapists. Uh, that'll also be very helpful. It won't go into the same depth as the McKinnis book, but there is quite a bit of information. So let's talk about so the imaging uh, procedures that are commonly seen out there. Well. We have the conventional radiograph. And again, this is a good term to use. Uh, we want to get away from calling things x-rays. Radiograph is correct and, and a more proper uh, medical term. Then we have an arthrogram. And uh, so an arthrogram is definitely going to be uh, specific for a joint. Arthur meaning joint. A lot of times they will uh, inject the joint. Um, these can be done uh, radiographically. These can be done with other imaging techniques. Um, MRI, CT, uh, it gives you a better view of the joint. Uh, myelogram is, of course, uh, viewing the muscle tissue more specifically. So these are all special types of primary radiographs. Um, we also have the myelogram, myel meaning spinal cord. Um, oftentimes, they will also inject a medium with these, um, in which they will look at uh, the spinal cord and the spinal canal with a contrast medium injection into the um, cerebral spinal fluid. Um, an angiogram, which is a specific type of radiographic test um, using video fluoroscopy uh, so that they can see blood flow within vascular structures. Scintigraphy or scintography, um, it's listed here as a, a bone scan. That, that would be one type. Usually on these, they inject a uh, radioisotope or a radiopharmaceutical drug. Um, and then they use a 2D image uh, with these gamma detectors that basically pick up the radio off um, radioisotopes degrading over time. Computed tomography, which is um, CT scan you've heard of, that also is a type of radiographic procedure. Ultrasonography or ultrasound, which we will discuss laser, uh, later, using um, hypersonic waves to uh, really develop pictures via computer of how those waves bounce off structures within the body. And then magnetic resonance imaging or MRI in which we use magnetic waves to um, basically hit a polar ion or an electron and uh, these magnetic resonance uh, waves hit it at 180 degrees so it basically twists it in the opposite direction. Now as your cells and your electrons uh, basically flip back to their normal position. Um, the sensors within the MRI will receive the signal and that's uh, how a picture is made. <clears throat> Moving on, let's talk about radiation absorption. All right, so, so it really depends on two things, both the thickness and the density of the material. So things that are very dense to radiographic waves, we will say they're radio dense, so they absorb or block much of the x-rays and therefore they're white all right so if you think about this you have your film if you follow the laser pointer here that's behind the structure you're trying to image so picture this being somebody's um, tib fib all right we have the x-ray tube that projects the radiographic waves through we'll see that radio dense structures block these waves absorb them and therefore this film remains more of a whiter color if not bright white for something like bone. As these waves go and pass through tissue that is not as radio dense, more of the radiographic waves pass through and they turn the film more of a gray color. And if you look all the way out here, the radiographic waves that do not hit any body part, like they're just flying through air, uh, the film will remain very black with. 
all right and then radiolucence is just the opposite okay so um, that allows radiographic waves to pass through all right here's a scale showing you the thickness and the density of different commonly seen structures so the top the brighter or the more radio opaque something is this is how it will actually show up on the radiographic films so that um, things like heavy metal which would be maybe a rod or a pin in the bone um, different implants that are made of metal pins staples that sort of thing um, they show up as very bright white because they are very radio dense bone is of course very radio dense particularly the cortical or the outer edges of the bones <clears throat> you'll see here as you go down through this scale that the thinner less dense something is the more easily the waves pass through and uh, the darker the image will be so notice the gray scale of this as well and remember it's the sum of all densities when you think of x-ray don't just think about bone all right think about those um, radiographic waves have to pass through everything between the uh, transducer and the actual film so when they're putting out those waves anything in between it uh, will show some sort of artifact on the film depending on its density so we have some arrows here if you follow the laser here number one you can see this block like structure that's actually air and gas in the intestines um, number two has this sort of white striated formation that's really uh, more adipose tissue all right we can um, can also see in number four we, we can see that that's really pointing to bone because it's both the femoral head and the acetabulum and notice how bright the uh, film is directly under the number number four there and number three is actually pointing up to the bladder so we have a little bit of gray shading there as well on this side and that's from water being in the in the bladder so it's important to realize even though we're doing a radiograph we think we're primarily viewing bone everything's going to show up depending on its radio density but of course because bone does have a high radio density it is not very radiolucent it shows up very brightly all right, two views is really important when you're looking at radiographic images. For example, when you you should be alarmed when you see this image on the left. You should think, "Wow, that is that's not in a good place." All right? So, what I'm talking about is this bullet right there. This person's been shot. Um from anterior to posteriorly, and this is where the bullet remains. So, you should be panicked right now thinking, "Well, that's definitely in his spinal canal." So this person could be paralyzed. They could have serious uh, central nervous system dysfunctions. It looks like it's in the actual foraminal space. All right, and this is hardware, by the way. Look at the bright white of this. This person has had a lumbar fusion. Um, so that's L1, L2. So that's in that space. This is L3, L4, L5. So they've had an L3 to L5 lumbar fusion. And these are the rods and screws that they put in, and that will prevent any motion from occurring at these segments. Not really point of this lecture, but it'll help when we get to the other spine content. So you should be thinking that bullet's in a very bad place. But then when we bring up the, uh, the additional views, so we bring up the straight um, posterior to anterior view, and see that the bullet's actually way laterally um, you can see the margin of the lungs here so it doesn't even look like maybe it's causing a pneumothorax so uh, the patient's prognosis instantly went up because we realized that it's really not in spinal cord at all so two views is important they say if you want to get the best um, uh, the best view of something it takes more than one point of view for radiographs it's a minimum of two for most things all right so here's your systematic approach when we're looking at bones and joints and we'll refer to this as the ABCs so your acronym is ABCs that'll help you all right a means alignment and that's the general alignment of the architecture so you're what are you looking at well you're looking at first generally uh, what do I see what are the size and number of bones present um, I look then at the contour of the bones that I do see present I'm looking for smooth continuous lines and then what do bones look like to adjacent bones so do I have normal spaces and space is going to show up much darker right because there's not bone in those spaces so you know what does the alignment look what does the space look like between segments of the spine or within the extremity joints does one side look for the other look like the other with a bilateral comparison 
that sort of thing. Um, you can read your abnormal findings there as well. All right, but this alignment and then one, two, three will really help you um, in looking for normal things. Here's some examples. So if we look at the uh, the contours, all right. So if we look at the image on the left, um, look at the contour of the bone. So look at the alignment. All right, so we can see the malalignment here, and this is the tibia, this thicker bone. This is a fibula. We have pretty severe malalignment of the fibula. We have a moderate malalignment of the tibia. All right, but then um, let's look at some other things. Look at the contour of the bone here, right and left. We see osteophytic changes occurring. Definitively see osteophytic changes. Um, <clears throat> we'll, we'll get into the bees here next. Here's some other things showing you alignment. So this patient most likely has rheumatoid arthritis, and this condition you see here of the hand would be called ulnar drift because all of the joints uh, drift towards the ulnar direction or point in that direction, offset. All right, so if you look, and what I'm talking about, this is your MCP joint where the laser is now. Okay, so all of them are pointing in that direction. So if, if you look at the alignment, obviously this is your index finger, that proximal phalanx right there should be straight in line with the metacarpal. So we have severe malalignment here. When we're talking about bone density, think of two main pillars here, general bone density and then abnormal texture. Those are your main pillars. So general bone density, normally there should be a contrast between soft tissue and bone with bone being uh, much brighter and a contrast between cortical, which is basically the edges of your long bones in particular, and cancellous, or the more spongy bone, that should not be as bright. Abnormal texture, well, you want to look for the normal trabeculae. You shouldn't see any thinness, fluffiness. Uh, it shouldn't look abnormally thickened in um, nonspecific areas. Uh, we don't want to see uh, excessive sclerosis, which looks like a bright buildup of white. We don't want to see osteophytes which are um, basically outcroppings of bone or exostoses oh. where bone is. Some things to help you visualize that, look on the film on the right and, or excuse me, on the left and look at how thin the margins of the bone are. Um, this is of course your femur and this is your pelvis, right? There's your acetabulum. If you look at the margins of bone, look how this fades off and it fades off out here into the greater trochanter. Um, this should be good sharp lines here on normal bone. All right, it should look like this, a bright white line, straight up. But it does not; it fades in and out. So we we don't have that good um, bone density. That's an osteoporotic port person. You can also see the kind of sponginess, the blotchiness of the structure here. Paget's disease, uh, which you've learned about in your medical orthopedics lecture, uh, basically has. Uh, poor, poor regulation, bone degeneration, and bone building occurring at the same time. Uh, so we can see this is actually a patient's femur. Up here there's a patella, fibula, and tibia. And we can see that we have areas of lysis where excessive bone is being broken down or it's a darker color. We have excessive sclerotic or buildup of bone areas. So this is all the tibia and this should look very uniform, but it doesn't. We have areas that are bright white. We have areas that are a darker shade. And here we just have some um, arthritic changes. So this would be some uh, degenerative arthrosis. And if you look at this bone density here, we see more of a, a straight line here, much more continuous. There is a little bit of sclerotic activity there, but that's a normal weight-bearing structure and is way less than over here where we don't have this normal joint space. We have bright white on both sides uh, evidencing that sclerotic activity or a buildup of the bone density in this region. <clears throat> and then your C of the ABCs is cartilage. <clears throat> Excuse me. Cartilage, we're really kind of looking at the things we can't see here. So I can see the bones, so therefore I can tell the space between the bones. And I know that in the space between the bones is the cartilage, which does not show up. So when I see black between bones, I know that cartilage fills that space. So normal means you have a well-preserved, maintained joint space. It's equal around all sides, or it anatomically makes sense. You don't see um, abnormal uh, tightness or less uh, black line between edges of the bone. Um, subchondral bone is that's the bone right below the surface, right? So it's below the um, 
cartilaginous bone, that should look normal and smooth. You shouldn't see increased deposition, erosions, or sclerotic activity. And then on um, adolescents and those that still have growth plates or epiphyseal plates, um, we can see those. Those will show up. They should be a normal size and line according to their age. We don't want to see abnormal thickness there either. Here's some examples showing you uh, differences in space. This on the left is actually a pre-op knee. Um, this patient would be going in for at least some sort of hemiarthroplasty, so they'd at least be replacing this compartment. So this patient is in a varus deformity of the knee. All right, so you see that the angle goes outward. And this medial compartment here is significantly more degenerated because we see less of a black line there. We see excessive black line here, but that means we have good normal cartilage in here, at least better integrity of the cartilage than here. The cartilage has broken down. We have subchondral bone that is brighter white on the edges because it's been weight bearing. <coughs> it's hard to see here. Uh, the arrows are pointing to uh, abnormal joint spaces. This patient has some severe joint degeneration that you can see all over and pretty much any joint you can visualize. What you should see normally, just to be clear, is a nice black semicircular line here on all these joints, which you definitely do not see. They have significant degeneration occurring at their MCP joints, their PIPs. You can't really visualize their DIPs with this image. Um, and so not only do you see poor uh, joint spaces, we also see erosions. Also see erosions. See how it looks like the bones eroded or eaten away there? That's more significant for things like inflammatory conditions such as RA, rheumatoid arthritis, or even gout. So it basically eats away at the bone. All right, soft tissues. Well, radiograph is not the best thing to use to visualize soft tissues, but nonetheless, it still can be used. <clears throat> we can look at things like muscle for things like fat pads and look at actual uh, margins of the capsule. Um, so it's really hard because soft tissues can have much more similar densities. They're similar in radio density, so it's kind of hard to visualize a lot of times. Um, but we can see extreme conditions. All right, so for example, look here at the line of periosteum of the bone, and this is a forearm. This is the radius. This is the ulna here. And look at how we have soft tissue buildup all along the edge of the bone. Also notice this grayness, this light grayness out here too that isn't down here further. That's probably showing some degree of edema present. <clears throat> Again, not the best way to visualize it, but it's there. Notice the arrows here demarcating the joint capsule. So we can see the joint capsule of the radial humeral and ulnar humeral joint. So you see that dark shade. That's capsule that's full of fluid. That's why it's, it's darker and we can see surrounding soft tissues out here. Okay, evaluation of fractures is going to be done using a specific uh, system. And remember, a fracture is really just a break in a bone. So we have a break in the continuity of bone or cartilage. Um, conventional radiographs are, are pretty effective for most fractures and dislocations. All right, we are going to use this little... Um, outline of Greenspan 7. So you definitely need to commit this to memory as well, just like your ABCs. <clears throat> we have the first being the anatomical site and extent of the fracture, basically if it's open or closed, two being the type of the fracture, complete or incomplete, based on if the cortice is completely fractured through or not. We have alignment of the fractures, direction of the fracture line, which way does it point, any special features such as impactions, which are when two bones um, are impacted or driven into one another, and an avulsion, which is where soft tissue pulls part of the bone away from the rest of the bone. Any Anything like joint dislocations, which is a associated abnormality, because remember we're considering fractures here, and a dislocation can be part of the fracture, but doesn't have to be. And then number seven would be any special types from abnormal forces, such as stress fractures or pathological fractures. An example of pathological fracture would be like maybe a fracture that occurs due to a specific pathology, such as osteoporosis. 
All right, so with <clears throat> site and extent, we're going to talk about things being either, um, you know, extra-articular, intra-articular. We're looking here at the femur. Notice these dotted lines. So the site would be, if it was in here, you'd say it was the proximal third of the shaft of the femur, the middle third, or the distal third. All right, know your joint lines so we can tell when things are extra-articular and intra-articular. And then extent refers to really, is it an open or closed uh, type of fracture? So this is definitively an open fracture uh, of the tib-fib. So you may be thinking, well, how do I know it's open? Open means it goes through the skin. We see this fissuring of the fracture line here. We can see soft tissue margin out here. So notice where the black just begins to turn gray. That's where the soft tissue begins. We see this line up and we see no soft tissue out here. We see clear bone. So that tells us this bone is sticking out through the skin. Skin has been ruptured. That is an open fracture. A closed fracture just means the skin and soft tissue overlying it are still intact. It hasn't broken through the skin. All right, number two is complete or incomplete. A complete fracture means that all the cortices are fractured, meaning that the line goes all the way through. Notice this dark fracture line through the tibia here. Even though it does Y off, this line ends, but this line continues right through. So look for the white cortex on the outside of the bone and make sure that the black fracture line extends all the way through. If it extends all the way through and both cortices are broken, complete. If it does not, then it's incomplete. On the right, you see an example of the same bone, the tibia. Incomplete fracture, notice the black fracture line, and notice we have this white bend here. All right, it didn't fracture through, it's not black didn't pop right through, so that's that's an incomplete fracture of the tibia. When it comes to alignment and uh, of fragments, I really want you guys to think about the position of the distal on the proximal section. All right, so where's the distal segment in relation to the proximal segment? So this is this is pretty easily. Um, so displaced fracture will have malalignment or loss of opposition, meaning the the structures are not aligned. We see soft tissues here of the hand. There's the metacarpals, there's the carpal bones, um, radius and ulna here. So there's your distal radius right there that the laser's tracing. There's your scaphoid. All right, so what's happened here is we have probably a Fouche type of injury. This is called a dinner fork deformity when we fracture the distal radius. In this case, it looks like both the distal radius and ulna have been fractured. So we have this dinner fork deformity here. Now, this is a proximal section. Right, this is a part of the bone closest to the body. This is distal, therefore, you would name this as a dorsal displacement or a posterior displacement. Oh, and you can also uh, talk about things like rotations that occur here. So you can be more specific about where the displacement is rather than just dorsal. All I see here is a dorsal displacement. Again, here's the importance of the uh, the two views. So we're considering alignment. So if you look at this Galizzi fracture, so that's a, a fracture of distal uh, radius and dislocation of the distal radial ulnar joint. See that things do look well aligned in the sagittal plane. All right, and we say, oh well, that's that's good alignment. A but when we look lateral at view. We can see here that that same exact image looks radically different. We can see here we definitely have. Um, a dorsal dislocation of the ulna. The ulna is off in the dorsal direction from where it should be. Uh, we have ventral or palmar angulation. It's approximately 25 degrees. So if you took a straight line here and then a straight line through that fracture segment, it should be approximately 25 degrees difference between those two. All right, so we would say dorsal dislocation of the ulna, because again, there's a thumb. So down here is a volar. And we have a ventral angulation of the radius. And before I forget, uh, I just want to uh, make sure I mention that your Salter reference, it's not a required reference, it's a recommended reference. Um, there will be one in reserve in the library. It goes through Greenspan 7 really nicely. Um, so that can also help as well. You don't have to have the McKinnis book. Uh, but it'll help. Also the internet is, is a wealth of information as far as uh, diagnosing fractures and such. All right, so direction of fractional lines described relative to the long axis of the bone. 
Notice your little key chart up in right hand corner of this slide. All right, comminuted means it's a bunch of little fractures. It's kind of like it's exploded. So you see a bunch of pieces. Oblique means it's an angled line like this. Um, oblique and transverse is pictured here. Transverse means straight across. So you can see here, if you look on the left, I think it's easier to see. It's a straight line and then it goes angled. So it's oblique, transverse. Spiral fracture means it spirals around like a spiral staircase. Transverse means straight across the long axis of the bone. So we see a transverse fracture here. We see an oblique fracture here. Special features include things like avulsions and impactions. Here's a good picture of an um, impacted femoral distal diaphysis femoral fracture. So it's in the distal third of the shaft. The fracture line is here, but the reason why we don't see a dark line going through it is actually the femur has been driven into itself. So it's impacted, and you can see the overriding of the fracture lines here, evidenced by the bright white. An avulsion means that soft tissue, usually it's tendon or ligament, has pulled its attachment site um, so aggressively that it's actually pulled part of the bone. So the attachment site didn't fail at the enthesis or where the soft tissue attaches to it. It actually failed below that bone pulled away from other bone. And that's what we see here. You can see this fragment on the uh, ASIS of the pelvis. Other associated abnormalities uh, can occur. They're usually talking about dislocations or subluxations. Um, here we can see other soft tissue abnormalities occurring. But what this is is the, the capitellum right here, circular structure. Notice the lines here of the ulna. So this is the ulna. This is the radius. We have a fracture of the ulna, evidence here and everything has been driven so far posteriorly behind the humerus that we also have a posterior dislocation of the radius. See the radial head should be up here interacting with the capitellum. All right, so special types of fractures, that's where we, these are more rare. So we think about abnormal stresses that may have been placed on it. Some examples are like stress fractures, pathological fractures due to a disease uh, process paraprosthetic fractures. That means it's a fracture that's occurred around some sort of prosthetic implant, um, a bone graft fracture occurring at the site of which they grafted bone together. Here are some pictures trying to show you that. This line right here on the calcaneus, this is calcaneus right here, there's your talus. That line right there, that is actually a stress fracture of the calcaneus, probably due to uh, somebody who repetitively ran, like a runner, maybe an athlete who has to run a lot for their sport, um, most common in runners, of course. And then this would be your paraprosthetic fracture. So what we see here is actually a total uh, hip replacement. Notice the screws going up. They will also epoxy in this cup out here. That's for the acetabulum. And then the smallest circular part here, that's actually the, the femoral head now. And see it's attached here. This should be one continuous line. This plate should go all the way down. But we have a paraprosthetic fracture. So the actual um, plates themselves, and there's two different plates, one here and one there, have actually broken. So we still have a fracture around the prosthesis. <clears throat> when it comes to growth plate fractures, uh, people usually classify them with the Salter-Harris classification. Um, you can read this for yourself, uh, but up to 20% affect the plate in adolescence. Um, these are your different types. They're self-explanatory. Follow these white lines here. So a one's like a nice, clean, transverse line. A two is a transverse line that also uh, extends up obliquely in the proximal direction. right? So it's extra articular here. Type three is a similar thing as a two, except it's, it becomes intra-articular. Type 4 we can see is both intra and external articular in that secondary fracture line. Uh, and type 5 is, is just directly through. And just be clear about this, it's kind of highlighted here, but you should see this is the epiphyseal plate, but there is also uh, a disruption here. So it shouldn't be this thick. So basically, where I said the fracture line is, that means it's basically the epiphyseal plate itself has fractured. All right. Here we can see the epiphyseal plate. We can see the fracture line that also extends up. Right. So I just want to reiterate that some of this should already be there. 
okay? Like this fracture crosses the epiphyseal line and that disrupts. Notice that the white lines don't ma mm, excuse me, match up perfectly right here. We also have more advanced type. <clears throat> we have CT scanning or computer tomography. Um, this involves regular radiographic x-rays. Um, it's the same principle as x-rays except we have these tubes that spin around and then we have the detectors that really absorb the x-rays. So what we can do is actually get a 3D image of this as this 360 degree arc occurs. And um, those of you that have CTs, you can hear and sometimes there's windows cut up here by your face so you can actually see the radiographic tubes spinning all the way around you. Now because we have more computer involved, even though they still use radiographic waves, they're going to be a lot more sensitive to, uh, to change. So they're going to show up with more subtle changes in color. We're going to be better able to pick up um, soft tissues than we were for standard radiographs. Um, but we're still not as good as the, uh, the latter type of imaging things, which we're going to talk about next, like MRI and ultrasound when it comes to detecting soft tissue. We're just better than a standard radiograph. Um, but there will be subtle differences. All right, so remember then, we're using the same radio density and radio lucent scale. This CT is going to be the best thing for visualizing bone um, and also looking for loose bodies uh, related to fractures and the complexity of fracture. Definitely best viewed here with a radiographic uh, structure. And they can take different slices and different views of this. It's not, they have computers that can reconstruct what look like actual 3D models of the bone in its entirety, like looking at the plastic models like you have in lab. They can do that on a computer so you can see all the way around. They can use axial slices in which you can see specific slices all the way through the bone. There are many different ways they can do this. Basically, can do is look at just this slice, flip it on its edge, and identify different structures. Uh, this should be in your note packet. You will have this picture right here on the right, and you'll have another picture on the left with a bunch of numbers to it, which are also labeled. So the concept is this. We're trying to look at this slice of L5S1, and we could look at it this way, in which other structures are superimposed. Notice how everything just kind of white outs down here, right? So they're superimposed there. They're all lying and it's a cumulative buildup of radio density. We can look at them very specifically by looking at this specific slice. And that's what you can see on the left hand side of your slide. <coughs> all right, here's some more complex fractures. Um, here's a standard radiograph on the left. All right, so we can see how much we see there. When we see some different fracture lines, this black margin here, is a fracture line. Here's your greater trochanter right there. It's hard to visualize, but there's a uh, intertrochanteric fracture that extends down through here. Uh, this is the femoral neck. There, this fracture line should be some level of a femoral neck fracture. We can also see a little bit of light shading up here, which is um, a little bit of a femoral head fracture. Uh, we see disruption up in here at the top of your screen we don't see a nice linear shape to the bone so you take the same image here and then we look at it via a CT with different shades of gray and now look at how the detail just pops out we can see the edges of the cancellous bone we can see these fracture lines through the femoral neck there's your inner trochanteric fracture it looks a lot worse on here because we can see it with all its details there's a pelvic fracture through the acetabulum there's a femoral head fracture, kind of like a divot fracture here. So this is a very complex fracture, both intra and extra articularly. All right, MRI is very similar to CT. It does use a gray scale to actually look at the images, um, but there's no radiation involved. All right, so it's actually interesting. I worked in MRI for a while, and they weren't sure about the long-term effects of MRI. Of course, the risks are better than CT, but for example, if you were currently pregnant and you wanted an MRI, you had to sign a disclaimer um, that said you would not hold the radiologist um, or the hospital um, accountable for any damage uh, to your unborn child in the future. So you couldn't come back and say, well, I had an MRI and they didn't explain to me the risks. Uh, basically, the risks, risks are we think it's safe, but we really don't know. Um, long term what could happen. Theoretically it should be completely safe though so you don't have to worry about radiation exposure. 
This was actually originally developed in the 40s, um, and so it's basically measuring emissions of energy. All right, so we basically hit these protons. So we're not absorbing anything. We hit protons in the body with this electromagnet coil that wraps all the way around this. This is a slice cut out, so it goes all the way around this coil, and we hit these different radio frequencies through it. All right, and what they do is they basically charge your protons. And when your protons flip back, they measure the em energy dispersion as they flip back. So this is definitely superior when viewing soft tissue because this gives us the best detail. It does work for certain pathologies of bone, generally not as good as CT. works a lot better for viewing soft tissues, joint capsule, um, fluid within tissues, um, uh, angiographic things if you want to look at vascularity, you want to you want to study the brain tissue, this works really really well. So it disrupts those protons and electrons and then takes them as they return back to their resting position. That's really the the basics of it and they tend to do these and look at them as slices. They can also weight the magnet differently to cause different types of grayscales that will uh, better vision tissues. So here's the two different scales. This is what's called a T1 scale on the left, and this is what's called a T2 scale on the right. Now this is the exact same spine, but notice how different it looks. Notice how some of the colors seem flipped. All right, This is how I memorize it. I memorize what's bright. In T1, fat's bright. In T2, fluid is bright. All right, So let's go back. T1, fat is bright. Notice where the images are drawn together. You actually see this white line there that's adipose tissue that's fat alright now if fat's bright that means fluids dark this is your spinal canal cerebral spinal fluid your vertebral discs have fluid in them notice how those are dark alright now if we come over to the T2 image now we have that fat that was out here is actually more of a gray color if you compare the two the cerebral spinal fluid, so fluid's bright, look how bright white that is. Come back to the intervertebral discs, look how much brighter they are on the T2 imaging. You need to be able to tell the difference between two of those. And what's actually happening to the MRI itself is that with a T1 image, fat's bright. Fat returns once the protons have been knocked, the protons align quicker so this is a shorter time duration in which the computer is sampling the energy return a t2 is a longer or slower time duration and fluid takes longer to bounce back to bounce its protons and electrons back so it emphasizes things that bounce back longer take longer to bounce back t2 uh, shows things that tend to bounce back quicker like fat they're brighter so it enhances them As we move on, you also need to know the difference between a CT and an MRI. All right, T1 MRI, again, remember fat is bright. All this out here is adipose tissue. All right. Now, whether it's a T1 or a T2, uh, one thing is, is pretty true, and that is that the cortices are always black. Notice that dark image there. Now this is a CT over here. Now already I think you can tell the difference in the detail. And the weight of the, the magnet actually has a lot to do with it. The higher the weight of the magnet, the, bait, the more magnetic pull it has and the cleaner and clearer the pictures. If we look at this MRI versus CT, and these are both of the knee again, I'm sorry. Uh, let me be a little more clear. This is your femur, this is your patella, femur and patella. If you look at the outline of the bone, that cortical bone, Again, we're dealing with uh, radiographs with a CT. So again, they're very radio dense. Notice how bright white the outline is everywhere. Notice that on the MR, it's dark. So it doesn't matter if it's a T1 or a T2 MR, it's going to be dark, that line. So that's the easiest way to tell. The cortex is bright. It's most likely a CT. <clears throat> MRI risks, you're dealing with a ginormous magnet. All right. Surgical clips can be displaced or moved. Now, this is sort of a, uh, a gray area here. All right. It doesn't mean no metal can go in the MRI. It means that non-ferrous metal 
Okay, non-ferrous metal can go in the MRI. For example, um, if you put something that had any degree of iron into it, like say an oxygen tank into an MRI unit, it's always going to go the strongest part of the magnet. So it'll be drawn to the center. Um, a paper clip, a watch, um, the clip in, in women's bra, um, maybe your eyeglasses, those may all, when you get to a certain point, um, be drawn into the magnet so they can be moved by the force but surgical um, stainless steel rods and plates usually will not move because they're stainless steel um, titanium won't move titanium is a non-ferrous metal so it all depends on what the metal is made up of what they will do is before they'll give you an MRI if you you're in a manual labor in which you may have gotten things like metal into your eyes at some point um, they'll do a radiograph to try to find metal um, in anywhere on your face or eyes and if they find that then they will not risk putting you in an MRI because it could cause blindness uh, damage to the uh, optic nerve or eyeballs or even worse it, it could be deadly and people have died from getting MRIs before based usually on some sort of metal moving or somebody bringing some degree of ferrous metal into the room when somebody was still in the magnet on the table <clears throat> all right also pacemakers, it's contraindicated, do not go in there with pacemakers uh, because your batteries are magnetized on a pacemaker just like other things, it'll stop it or it'll throw off the rhythm. Um, I've seen it stop watches pretty regularly. Uh, if you go in there with your wallet, it'll strip the magnetic strip of your credit card. So um, you really have to be more careful around the MRI because there are some serious risks. With diagnostic ultrasound, we're using sound waves and um, a transducer that puts it out and then also receives the images. Okay, so we use the terminology of echoicness. So if the, it's very echoic means it's very bright, it's hyper echoic. So that would be white, like number one, which is the Achilles tendon. If it's dark, then it's hypoechoic, and that would be dark, like three is subchondral bone, subcortical cortical bone of the uh, uh, calcaneus. Two is, of course, the cortical line of the calcaneus, so it's more hyperechoic, and the tendon is also uh, hyperechoic. So what we would see is the transducer would be up here filming down through into the tendo Achilles. There's the Achilles and where it inserts on the calcaneus. Um, Diagnostic ultrasound is difficult to read. There is a, a huge learning curve because there's not really set planes in which to use the modalities where there's set planes and schedules for the other uh, type of uh, imaging that we've learned about so far. So you kind of have a, a standard way of viewing it. Here it's they really just put the tissue in the best way in which to image it or expose it. So move on. So you would definitely want to document this was a transverse sonogram. And you may be thinking, well, if it's difficult to read and hard to perform, why am I doing this? Why am I learning about this? You're learning about this because, for example, in uh, the clinic at school here, we have a diagnostic ultrasound machine in which we can use to just immediately visualize soft tissue. Um, so it works really well. Uh, you can immediately use it. It is within your practice act, and you can interpret your findings. So this transverse means it's held transverse of dislocated biceps tendon. Biceps tendon running up here. We have the um, sonogram transversely mounted across it. What we see here is uh, this is soft tissue up here, so superficial to deep. There's your cortical bone. There's your inner tubercular groove right here. Biceps tendon should be sitting right here. And remember that tendon uh, tissue was also hyperechoic, so it should be bright white, but it's not. It's gray here. Look at this ball of bright white over there. That ball is, as you see highlighted in yellow, that is actually uh, the long head of the biceps tendon, and it should be in this position, so it is dislocated. Notice how they have the forearm supinated, palm up, uh, to better view that structure. What are the pros of uh, ultrasound? Well, it's, it's cheap and it's portable. You can buy the unit, and there's not as much recurring costs. Maybe software upgrades, but that's about it. It doesn't really use materials other than ultrasound gel. Um, there's no known detriment to exposure. You can use as much as you can, and it's dynamic in real time. You can put the patient in the provocated uh, position. Um, you can uh, move the tissue while you're doing the ultrasound, so it's not a purely static process. It works really, really well. Problem is, it's really difficult to learn. 
it takes a while to learn to know exactly what you're looking at. Um, oftentimes you will have to visualize the unaffected side when you're learning before you visualize the affected side to see um, to make it easier to pick up differences between sides. Um, bone does block the ultrasound waves so you can't really see things past bone if the bone is blocking the sound waves um, so that'll prevent further visualization. All right thank you for your interest um, and uh, if you have any questions regarding this lecture please let me know.